Mr. John Quinn, and he's supported by his wife, Glenis. John is a person with dementia, and he's going to uh, share with us today on uh, rehabilitation. Uh, we need to think outside the box. Thank you. Thank you. A friend of mine was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia. He used to be a truck driver and tinkered with cars and engines most of his life. But only 18 hours after he had MRIs, etc., that resulted in his diagnosis, he lost his license. He felt like his whole life had shattered. At the time, he was in his mid 40s with four children. His wife had to return to full-time work to continue paying off the mortgage and to support the family. But by the time he was 50 years old, when his youngest child was seven years old, he was placed into a care facility because there was no one at home to care for him. The average age of the other residents was about 85 years old. He felt hopelessness and also a failure because he couldn't provide for his family. There was no immediate rehabilitation for him. However, soon afterwards, a friend, of, uh, a friend told him about a group of men who were rebuilding an antique truck. Years later, they still catch up every week to work on this project together. Now he, was, now he is proud of what he is achieving, albeit in small steps. In time, the organisers hope that there will be a restored, functioning antique truck available for street parades TV advertisements and movie sets. This is an example of what rehabilitation might look like. Or is it enablement? Or is it empowerment? In some health areas, for example, with various main uh, forms of addiction, the word enablement has different connotations than in the dementia arena. So we must be mindful of the meaning of words here too. Also, I'll later refer how I felt disempowered by others then later with time and unexpected support, regain the sense of being empowered. Some of us who live with dementia are advocating for the correct use of language in the media and within our communities. Perhaps here is another area where better awareness of language can improve our lives. Whatever the correct word is, the result should be better outcomes for people living with dementia. Here in this con context for simplicity, I'll use rehabilitation and enablement interchangeably. However, it will not be effective. It will be only effective if it empowers us. In an ideal world, some types of rehabilitation relevant to a person's current life and the personal symptoms of dementia would be offered at the time of diagnosis. Everyone has a right to rehabilitation to their changing abilities. But let's not dismiss any type of rehabilitation. We need to think outside of the box for the best outcomes to, to empower us. Everyone, everything with value will be valuable. Who determines what is value? I believe that it must be the person with the diagnosis in the first instance. This type of conversation and the ensuring uh, negotiation is relevant regardless of the age of the person living with dementia. However, it is more important when someone young is diagnosed, as there is emerging realisation that when a younger person is diagnosed with dementia at the earliest opportunity, there will be a longer period of successful engagement with their current lives. Immediate support and contact with someone who can guide the person living with dementia and their family through this tumultuous life-changing period would maintain so some hope for, for the possibilities for the future and feelings of being valued as a person who can contribute to their family and society. At least in my own case, I believe that I still could have had a sense of purpose and self-esteem, but I lost that when I lost my career. The career that I loved and was respected in had taught me skills and knowledge for 35 years. Yet suddenly, in 2008, I not, only, I not only couldn't do it due to my symptoms, 
I didn't have the opportunity to return to it with support or adaptations and, and, and post-diagnosis. Interestingly, for the past two years, with, the, with encouragement and lots of support, I've been able to use those skills that I learned throughout my lifetime in my career, in my advocacy. This advocacy has also opened many new pathways and opportunities for me that I couldn't have envisaged. And I value that. Through my advocacy, I've met new, genuine, lifelong friends. I've had the opportunity to meet with people who inspire, inspire many. And I've been to places where I wouldn't have considered before. I've regained a passion, a focus, and a purpose again. Prior to this, I felt that everything about who I was had been taken away from me by dementia. And by the responses of those who could have offered support if they'd only looked at me as the person who I was, not just dementia. I can't learn new things easily. I get lost in the process. And if I do manage to learn new things, it takes an enormous amount of time and effort on my part and patience by others. However, I still have, and I still have, many skills and expertise in particular areas that the post-diagnostic model forgot to address or encourage. In my case, I was an educator, a school principal or deputy principal of large primary schools, mentoring others, encouraging both the students and fellow educators to engage in learning skills and knowledge for a successful life. In other words, lifelong learning. But who else was I? What else was I passionate about? I've always been a caring person and a family man. But also, what comes to mind in my, in, in, is, is my interest in active participating, participation in sports. I not only trained and, enc and encouraged the students in a number of sports at the school that I was at, but I also enjoy being a spectator of many sports. During the last 25 years, I've run three marathons, about 20 half marathons, a triathlon, and 30 charity fun runs. So as you can imagine, I've always been reasonably fit. However, I have also participated in many challenging feats in recent years since my diagnosis such as the Great Wall of China Half Marathon, and I've climbed Mar Mount Taranaki in New Zealand. In addition, since I started being involved with advocacy, I've also used my athletic ability to raise much needed funds and awareness in two specific challenges. Cycling through Vietnam and Cambodia after buying a bike when I couldn't drive any longer, and walked our second Camino de Santiago, 825 kilometres, from France across the top of Spain. Whilst I could do the physical challenges, they wouldn't have been possible without the support of others, particularly my partner, Glennis, who did all the planning, the organisation and problem solving to ensure that I was able to successfully undertake these events. So each of us has already had, so each of us already had expertise, interests and passions prior to our diagnosis which if acknowledged and carefully nurtured and encouraged, can enable us to remain independent and interested in engaging in our future lives, albeit with some adaptations and support where necessary. We need to look beyond the deficit model of what we can't do. Instead, look at the skills and knowledge that we already have. Board certified internist and geriatrician, Dr. Alan Power agrees. In his book, Dementia Beyond Drugs, he states, although there are cognitive de deficits, many complex abilities are already preserved, which should be identified and cultivated. Others in the medical field and allied health professionals, governments and organisations, and our own family and friends need to get on board with this concept to encourage us to maintain our skills and provide individuals personal programs and career support so that we can continue to be independent for as long as possible. I already know what I can't do. I knew that years before I received the diagnosis. I'm reminded, of, reminded about it daily 
when I get confused or frustrated, knowing that everything, everyone is thinking about uh, at a different speed and level. I am particularly reminded of them when I travel, have the rare night, late night with my son at the football, or after the many social interactions that occur throughout each day. And strangely, I'm subtly reminded of them when some people challenge my diagnosis because I can interact with others and I'm reasonably fit. Therefore, I don't look like I have dementia. However, they don't see how I can't function for hours after engaging in most activities. Please don't misunderstand me though. The type of rehabilitation that people usually think of is also very important. For example, occupational therapy, speech therapy, physiotherapy. However, when it's dementia, aren't these therapies really an ailment? I'm never going to rehabilitate back to close to my former self, as I may have after a stroke or a heart attack. In about 2011, Glenis said to my neurologist that she was aware that there are speech therapists who specialise in rehabilitation after a stroke or heart attack. She questioned whether there was one who, who specialised in dementia to hopefully provide strategies and knowledge that we didn't have that might assist us in our daily communication. His reply was he'd never been asked that question. However, there has been changes since then. <coughs> this time last year, we were asked to give the consumer perspective to the Australian Federal Minister for Health on a new government department or on a new government document for people with dementia. This document has some excellent points in in the 109 principles of care. There are two references to accessing speech therapists. We also need speech therapy, speech language therapy for people who have word finding, processing problems or language concerns, etc. like I have. The medical profession needs to consider authentic rehabilitation, which is vital for younger people living with dementia or those in the early dementia process. Are some attitudes because dementia is a terminal condition for which there is no cure? I don't know. However, through my involvement on a national committee, where up to 40 different research activities are currently happening, I'm aware there's some very good innovative research that includes a focus on empowerment. So there's emerging hope for, for change in attitudes. I personally have done a little research on what can impact on the progression of dementia and what keeps our brains healthier. Things like the effects of music and learning new languages and skills. As a result, I've formed an acronym. It's my name, it's N-A-M-E-S. N for nutrition, A for attitude and acceptance, M for mental activities, music and meditation, E for exercise, and S for support, sleep, socialising and setting goals. Some of the activities that I engage in for my names include learning Spanish, doing crosswords with my non-dominant hand, volunteering each week, advocating, writing to the editor of the local newspaper and writing a blog. My names keeps me on track to do what I believe will help me. I want you to consider these questions. What value do our existing skills hold? What value is there in learning through experience rather than in isolation, for example, in a one-to-one -one class with a therapist? What value do we place on participation with, with fun and social engagement? How can we be empowered through support and opportunity to live as independently and as fulfilling a life as possible. I'll finish with another quote by Dr. Alan Power in Dementia Beyond Drugs. And he quote, and he says, and I'll quote, well-being is not dependent on cognitive and functional ability and should be maximised in all people. There has to be a paradigm shift in the way we view people with dementia. Thank you.